helped f to found Dance Safe, who does some incredible work for harm reduction at festivals and raves and places like this for people who are using these medicines for maybe a more Dionysian use. And he's currently now working on a feature-length movie with the working title MDMA The Movie, and focused mostly on the therapeutic use of MDMA as well as harm reduction around the use of MDMA. So uh, please join me in, in thanking Emmanuel for coming out. Whoa, it is bright. There's nobody out there. <laughs> I'm Emmanuel Spherios. I founded uh, Dance Safe 18 years ago. Thank you. And the first thing I want to say is we've come a long way in 18 years. I mean, really, it might not seem that way, but uh, the young people who Dance Safe was serving back then are now starting to take positions of power in government and TV and public health. And the media has been so much better around harm reduction now than it was back then. So I see a, a, a lot of hope. Um, how did I start Dance Safe? <laughs> um, I've never told this story before, really. Um, many reporters have asked me that. And um, uh, I'll, I, I'll start. I first did MDMA when I was 16 years old. Um, for therapy reasons. I was not a raver. This was back in 1986, one year after it became illegal. Yeah, I wasn't a raver, although raves, I think, had started back then. There were some underground events. I grew up in Florida. Um, I was actually a punk, um, and I, hi there, uh, and I, <laughs> yeah, bad brains. So, um, uh, but, um, but I got into therapy. Um, there was abuse in my past. I had run away from it. I wasn't living at home anymore. I was living in a warehouse in downtown St. Pete, Florida, playing in my punk ska band. And um, I got lucky to get hooked up with some adults, uh, some Quakers from the American Friends Service Committee who, yeah, yeah, really saved my life. They channeled my anger into a positive direction, and I became an activist at a very uh, young age. And I could have very easily... Uh, gone down a road uh, of self-destruction without them. And one of the things they said is, we, we, have you considered therapy? I, you know, I, what's therapy? Oh, it's when you talk about your problems. <laughs> so I, these two grown-ups, the first grown-ups in my life who treated me with respect, uh, had a big impact on me, and I got involved in the co-counseling uh, movement which if you don't haven't heard of that, it's sometimes called reevaluation counseling. I don't even know if it's still around, but it's sort of poor people's therapy. If you can't afford a therapist, you just you know, these you, you learn therapy techniques and um, you take turns. One person half hour plays the role of therapist for the other and then you switch sides. So I started doing this. A a and then I saw an article in Newsweek in nineteen eighty five about MDMA. And the first line of the article was this was the drug that L S D was supposed to be. <laughs> And is that Rick laughing? <laughs> Rick was in the article. And uh, uh, it, was, it was, you know, so maybe you don't know, the first articles about MDMA, even when, they were, when it was banned, you know, probably thanks to Rick, were about its use. Over 10 years it was being used by therapists, and they tried to keep it underground because they knew there would be a crackdown, and that happened. I went to search it out. I was like, okay, you know, I want to do this because I was on this path now of healing. And it took me six months to find it as a 16-year-old punk kid. You know, the, no punks were doing ecstasy at the time, right? Um, but I ended up finding someone, and I remember in Tampa going out sitting outside of this nightclub in Ybor City, and he w gave him my money, and he went in. And uh, what seemed like a long time, this goth chick came out of the club. Are you Manny? I was like, yeah. And I think she was more nervous to be selling drugs to a teenager than I was to be buying them. But uh, she was kind of goth and I felt comfortable because I was a punk and that was sort of my culture, you know. And she hands me these two pills and she says, um, don't take more than one. Right? And um, here's my card if you want more, give me a call. So I ended up taking with my best friend a couple of um, weeks later and um, uh, began a profound uh, path of healing, uh, allowing me to forgive my father. Um, and eventually when uh, his brother died and I was 30 years old, I um, uh, took MDMA with my father. 
and the first time I saw him cry. And I can't say he changed completely at that time, but uh, up until that uh, experience with him, when we talked to each other, you know, twice a year or whatever, we never would say I love you to each other. But now after that, every time we did uh, speak, we said uh, to, I love you to each other. And um, he passed away in 2012, and I was with him holding his hand for his last breath. And I know that would not have happened without the, the path that I went through healing through MDMA. So, um, I, uh, <laughs> think I never told this story to the media, right? Because I was working in harm reduction, right? And uh, I was trying to just stick to message. You know, now I'm uh, independent and I'm making a film and I want to tell the whole truth about MDMA. So, um, uh, I feel free the, to tell this story now, first time publicly. Um, but that's not really, so, so in some ways I started Dance Safe to honor MDMA, in some way. But really what happened is that, uh, and I probably did it a dozen or so times in that year or two, and uh, then went on to, you know, I, I actually, I dropped, I had dropped out of high school, but I went to college and um, graduated, and then I lived on some intentional communities for a few years, and I ended up in San Francisco. Now we're at 1998, and uh, someone gives me MDMA again, and, uh, oh, sure, I'll do it again, right? And I get online, because now we have the internet. Right before uh, to research MDMA, I had to g go to the index of periodical literature. Who remembers that out there? <laughs> yeah, like three stories high. You know, these big green books of every you could look up a topic, and it was every magazine article that was printed about it, it would tell you where to find it. You know, in the library. And online, I discovered that the market was highly adulterated, and uh, people were dying uh, from fake ecstasy. And the Dutch government had a program where they would go out to raves, set up booths, and test pills for users to help them avoid the fake pills. And uh, a light bulb went off in my head, and I, I said, I'm going to do this here. Um, I knew that it was going to be successful. I've had a lot of ideas in my life, and I've started a lot of organizations, actually. And um, some I've thought, oh, this might work. And some I go, oh, this is going to work. And Dan Safe was one of them. My movie's one of them. <laughs> going to be successful. I just knew it. And the one reason why is because the testing kits were a tool to uh, organize. I had been volunteering for many years with uh, Food Not Bombs. Anyone know them? Yeah. Four years cooked and served free vegetarian meals uh, in Berkeley, California. Um, four days a week. Uh, it was doing that. And we dan uh, Food Not Bombs did more than just homeless advocacy. Uh, they also provided a service. And providing that service was so powerful. Um, I realized if you want to organize against the drug war, if you want to start a peer-based drug education program where young people can educate themselves on how to more safely use drugs, um, and you just go out with literature, it's going to be really hard to kind of get this off the ground. But if you had a, a tool that you can actually help somebody, or, or if you're actually feeding homeless people, right, then, you know, you instantly win the trust. Um, and so... Um, well, so I did it. I have to say, though, uh, I really thought at the time that I was just helping uh, people test their ecstasy, uh, you know, so they couldn't get the bunk stuff. I, I, how do I say this? I had no idea just how much misuse and abuse was going on. Uh, in these scenes. I'd never been to a rave before my first event behind a dance safe booth. And I remember seeing a young woman, maybe a teenager, walking around with a little spoon saying, bump of K, bump of K, bump of K, and other young people leaning over and snorting a mystery white powder off of a spoon from a total stranger. And I was shocked because I would never do something like that, and I didn't know what to make of this. And <laughs> I, like, uh, realized Dance Safe uh, needs to be more than just about testing drugs, and it had to become about education. Also, I realized uh, in talking to young people about uh, ecstasy, um, 
they didn't even know ecstasy was its own drug, its own molecule, MDMA. I was like, where do you think ecstasy is? Oh, it's these little pills that you buy at raves, some of which make you feel good and some of which make you feel bad. The ones that make you feel and I was like, so why do some make you feel good? Oh, they have a better combination of drugs in them. What drugs? Oh, oh, heroin, cocaine, they listed off whatever drugs they knew. The ones that made you feel bad were the ones that had the bad combination of drugs. That's what a lot of people thought. Now, these were a lot of them were all ages events, a lot of young people, but I realized, oh my God, we have to start from the very beginning. So I wrote this ecstasy health and safety manual and we trained our chapters to start from the beginning. MDMA is its own molecule and you're not getting, you know, good MDMA or bad MDMA, you're getting real, or sorry, ecstasy is its own molecule. And you're not getting you know, good ecstasy or bad ecstasy, you're getting real ecstasy or fake ecstasy. Um, <laughs> what's so interesting and, uh, you know, unfortunate but telling is that, you know, now um, the young people call it Molly, right? They still, ecstasy is still now, and now the kids are right. Ecstasy are those pills, right? Like, it's not MDMA anymore, right? Ecstasy is not MDMA, right? But the myth, of course, today is that Molly is pure MDMA. The powder form, if you find a little bag of white powder and someone says it's Molly, oh, that's pure MDMA. And that word, Molly, came from Molecule, from the work that Dance Safe was doing back in the late 90s, saying, you know, MDMA is its own molecule. <laughs> so you can't win without, well, that's what I say. What I realized too, and you got to remember today, de the, the fatalities have quadrupled. There's about 20 young people a year dying after they take MDMA or Molly. Um, some of it is um, bath salts, methylone, but an increasing amount of it is actually MDMA. Um, it was about three to five a year back in the late 90s. And um, uh, so things have just gotten worse. I, I can explain why. Maybe I, I'm talking a while, so you can come up to me. If you want to know why MDMA deaths are increasing, MDMA-related deaths, come and talk to me because I've spent the last two years really figuring it out, and it has a lot to do with uh, loose powder rather than pressed tablets and the flood of bath salts, on the, but maybe in an ironic way, uh, let me know. But what I realized, things have only gotten worse after the, uh, since I've started DanceSafe. Um, and, and I just realized DanceSafe really hasn't been providing harm reduction services for ecstasy or MDMA all these years. It's been providing harm reduction services for prohibition. And what we really need is to end prohibition in order to save lives. And, 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 and th this, is, this is very, very important. <laughs> we need to go on the offensive right now and start advocating uh, for the legal regula regulation of MDMA, the legalization or legal regulation of MDMA. Um, not so much for the civil rights argument, uh, but that's true too, right? But because if we provided adults with safe legal access to MDMA in limited quantities, uh, we would eliminate the criminal market, um, not just uh, the fake pills that are on that market, but also reducing access to minors. And that's kind of hard for a lot of us to, you know, out and proud say because most of us come from a psychedelic uh, using past like myself and, you know, but we need to be able to hold simultaneously in our minds, truthfully, the civil right to use these substances to change our consciousness with the imperative that we protect the weak and vulnerable and particularly children. It's right, it's true, it's not just strategic because that's what's gonna pass, but if you're a strategic minded person, think of it that way. That's what we, we need because uh, I actually have a 15 year old now who is interested in psychedelics and I have the same fears that other parents have. You know, it's easy if you have a very risk averse child and they're just not gonna, you know, be, be interested in experimenting with drugs, but at least, you know, 
half of us are novelty seekers and um, that's just going to happen and that's it kind of scary it's, but it's more scary when you know that she could be taking anything um, that she won't have any idea how much she's taking that her peers are telling her that oh molly is pure <laughs> or you know we we could dance safe could fight for another 20 years trying to educate people on safer use, but it's going to continue to fail, and it's only going to get worse if we don't end prohibition. So I guess I'll stop there. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> awesome. A round of applause, both for Emmanuel and the work of Dance Safe, because it's always activists on the ground working their asses off to get stuff done.